My name is Lloyd Huey, and I want to thank you for joining us. Uh, this evening with, with me also is Carol Clark Flanagan, who will also be presenting with us. So Carol? We'd like to start this evening with the land acknowledgement. We begin by acknowledging that the land that is now the town of Simsbury, on which we gather, is the territory of the Wetog and Masako peoples, who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. We further recognize the Wetog Masako people's migration to Salisbury, Connecticut, alongside other Tunxis tribes after Metacom's rebellion. The Wetanuk, Pequot, Putuktuk, Tunxis, and Mohican peoples came together along the Housatonic River, creating the contemporary Shatokuk Nation. We thank them for their strength and resilience in protecting this land and aspire to uphold our responsibilities according to their example. Thank you. Good evening. We're doing some tech hula hoops here. We're on Zoom. Hi, everybody. It's so nice to see you. And we're also recording this for SCTV. Um, so I'm going to start by talking about Hispanic people's history. Certainly not going to be able to cover the whole thing. It is a huge, broad, diverse spectrum of people who identify as Hispanic from many, many countries of origin. I would like to comment at the very beginning, though, by saying that we've gotten a couple of comments now. Um, thank you very much. We love getting feedback from the community that they wish that we were um, more positive in our tone and that they were, while they were interested in the history, it seemed to be um, dark and not one that inspired a lot of um, hope or confidence. So I wanted to start this by saying up front what I believe. We are a nation of immigrants. I believe that the strength of this country is in its diversity. And I think also that with each group of immigrants who come to the United States, they bring with them sort of the fresh look at what makes this country great. And so I, I may not seem that I feel that way when I'm talking about all the horrible treatment that some immigrants have gotten or the xenophobic attitude that Americans often adopt when a huge influx of foreigners arrive on our shores. But please do understand that that is exactly what I feel. And I think that immigration makes this country strong. I'm not going to talk about the crisis at the border. It's been very politicized. Um, I'm not going to be talking about largely, I will talk historically about how we um, gained and expanded so much territory from Mexico, uh, but I'm not going to be talking about um, Mexican immigrants in California. I've chosen instead, because this is the great state of Connecticut, um, we have the largest Puerto Rican population in the country, and Hartford is the most Puerto Rican city in the state of Connecticut. So when I focus on the here and now, I'm going, I've chosen to focus on Puerto Rican culture and Puerto Ricans who actually are, some people don't know this, United States. Okay, I'm getting some help from Lloyd. <laughs> um, so I'm going to say, you know, what do you think of when you think of Hispanic people's history? Music. I think of music. I think of music so amazing and so varied that I have to get out of my chair and dance. I also think of amazing and varied cuisine. I don't really know anyone personally who doesn't love some aspect of Hispanic food from some country in Latin America. Color. I think of vibrant color. And I also think of art and literature. There are so many renowned poets and novelists and artists 
from the whole spectrum of countries in South America and the Caribbean and the West Indies. And so I think of those things when I think of Hispanic culture. I don't know about all of you on uh, Zoom what you think. Um, does anyone have anything that he or she would like to share? Hi, Carol. Hi, Rick. Um, I actually, I think about diversity because um, we're not talking about one place or, or one culture. We're talking about lots of different countries of origin. And we're talking about not only are there lots of different countries of origin, but different cultures within those countries. So it's not one thing. Absolutely correct. Absolutely. I mean, when you think about the number of countries just from Mexico all the way down to Argentina, um, it is stunning, right? And all of these people, um, with the exception perhaps of Brazil, which would identify as Latino, um, all identify as Hispanic. And that is um, a language-based identity that we're gonna talk a little bit about, but you're right about the diversity of culture. And um, I wish we could get a little of this color into our life here in Connecticut. Maybe we will. Uh, this is a quote from a Mexican-American priest about belonging and the knowledge, how important that is to humans to feel like they belong. Knowledge of fundamental belonging is one of the deepest needs of humans. When this is met, it's not even a thought about it as a need, but when it's threatened, or missing, it causes great pain and consternation. Just briefly about Connecticut. Um, for decades, there has been this creation of a really, I would call it a new ethnic force of Spanish pe speaking people in all, really, actually all of North America. And it's like a great collective construction project with no, and this isn't a criticism, it's exciting, with no master architect having decided exactly how it's gonna play out. People from different homelands and from different classes um, pursuing their own goals form tactical alliances with one another. And from these alliances grow institutional structures like political coalitions. You'll see that in Connecticut when we get to it. TV networks, um, artistic and literary networks. And these alliances create common interests from the experience of interaction facilitated, and this is really important, facilitated by a common langu language and other cultural understandings. It's a series, a si whole feeling of community. And as Rick pointed out, one of tremendous diversity at the same time. I don't think I can think of another identity group that actually has can make this same claim. Hispanic people are also, and I think this is important in this country, challenging the very rigid black white uh, definition of what it means to be American. And language is at the center of this. Um, the insistence on this on one language is unlike any other immigrant group that I have ever studied. Uh, you could say that it's a defense, perhaps against Anglo arrogance. Um, perhaps it's also pride in a strong linguistic tradition. Um, but the practicality of it as well. Like you, I had a girl at school who was giving her senior speech and she's from Colombia. And she was so nervous about coming to the United States because her English wasn't really that good. But when she got to school, and this is a boarding school, there was another girl at the school from Paraguay. That's really far away. And she, was, she felt so um, embraced and felt like she belonged because there was another student who spoke Spanish. I asked around um, before I, we decided, Lloyd and I decided to call it Hispanic People's History. Should we call it Hispanic or should we call it Latino? And there was a lot of, um, not disagreement, but just people chose one or the other. Um, it seemed to me that, and I could be a little off on this, that people who saw themselves as progressives were tended to use the term Latino. Um, but it seemed like there was a very strong pull toward Hispanic 
um, because of the language and because that term has been around. Some people that prefer Latino prefer it because it hasn't already been decided what it is and doesn't carry with it um, a lot of cultural, uh, mm, I don't know exactly the word to use, but it's, it's sort of pre, already comes pre-packaged, the term Hispanic, and Latino seems to be newer um, and a little bit more politically. Uh. So naming is an act of authority. And you've seen this before. I'm going to now go back into the history really quickly, I promise, of the expansion of the United States. Um, this is a famous painting of Manifest Destiny and Americans fundamentally in the 19th century, coming into the 19th century by the 1830s, believed in this. That their civilization, um, which is white, this is Columbia, she's moving across the country and as she's moving in her hands, she's carrying the telegraph wire. And the transatlantic railroad, you can see that Lloyd was talking about with um, Chinese immigrants who worked on that, the laying of the track for that railroad and dynamiting mountains to make space for it. You see wagon trains, people, pioneers coming to this empty land, which of course we know is not empty. And then you also see on the side of the picture, which is a little bit in shadow, that people are sort of retreating in the face of this civilization that is coming across the continent. And down in the foreground you see hard-working Americans farming, tilling the land, and you do see buffalo and indigenous people sort of fading out in the presence of this. Um, Manifest Destiny was a real ideology that undergirded American expansion. It was a very sort of mm, positive sounding uh, belief in their own destiny, God-given destiny. So the expansion in the 1800s included the Louisiana Purchase um, early on in 1803, which doubled, doubled the size of the United States. Um, and then came the annexation of Texas and then the Mexican-American War, um, 1846 to 48, and then following it later, the Spanish-American War, um, where the United States, it only lasted for 16 weeks, and the United States uh, took on the Spanish Empire to free the Cuban people, um, and then didn't really actually free them for quite some time. And the United States also gained the Philippines for a while, and this is when the United States gained Puerto Rico. So sorry about the resolution here. The white in the center is the Louisiana Purchase, and you can see that the original size of the United States over on the right side of the screen in beige, it did truly double the United States. Okay, these are two maps showing, I'm gonna leave them up here for a second. This is the Texas, I think if you can get your uh, bearings, you'll see this is 1820 on the left. This, all of this territory, here's Baja, up into California, New, uh, where New, uh, New Mexico and Arizona are, this was all uh, belonged to uh, Mexico. Um, and this area down here, the, there was this belief that the country was big enough for the Mexicans, the Anglos, and the indigenous people turned out not to be the case. Um, this is a very common, I'm just gonna explain this, this happens over and over and over again when white settlers move into an area that is already occupied um, by native people. The first stage is a frontier of, it's a frontier, is a frontier of inclusion, where both the native people living in that space and the white European settlers who have come in um, live together in harmony. They often intermarry. The white settlers coming in need the knowledge of the native people there about you know, where to find stuff to eat, how to grow things, you know, the lay of the land, so to speak. Um, it is inclusion. It is a 
oh my God, I made a mistake on the slide. So on the left side, it should say frontier of inclusion. I'm so sorry. And then it moves steadily toward a frontier of exclusion. Sorry. Um, in the first stage, uh, the native people outnumber the whites. So this is a demographic or a population analysis, but it holds pretty true everywhere the United States expanded. So the first stage is um, not very many white people. Second stage is really unstable. The number of whites coming in is increasing rapidly. And gradually, maybe not even gradually, there comes to be a thinking, a shift in attitude that the native people really don't actually belong there. That it's the white settlers who belong there because of the picture you saw with Manifest Destiny, among other things. And so there is a growth of enormous hostility um, and often conflict, armed conflict. Um, to in amongst the population and eventually what's going to happen is the third stage is it will become a stable settlement for whites. More whites come in and the native people, um, it could be Mexicans, it could be indigenous people, are driven out or isolated or killed. So this movement from a frontier, sorry, of inclusion is about how many white people are here and it always in history has moved in the continental United States to a frontier of exclusion. The Spanish-American War is actually, I don't know if calling a war popular might seem odd, the most popular war in the United States to that, except for the Revolutionary War. And um, I don't know how much you know about Teddy Roosevelt, our president, he's a really fascinating guy. Uh, he was a jingoist which is a man who's more than just um, a nationalist. He would take it to its full expression of patriotism, which would be war. And he thought war was actually pretty exciting. And so when we were considering going in to Cuba to save the Cuban people from the yoke of Spanish colonialism, um, McKinley, who was the president, really didn't want to go to war. He didn't. He was, like, reluctant. And Teddy Roosevelt said of his president, um, William McKinley, he said that he had, quote, about as much backbone as a chocolate eclair. One of the things that happened that got the war, that sparked the war, is there was a U.S. battleship called the Maine in Havana Harbor as a presence. Um, things were tense, and it exploded. And so the yellow press, or the, the you know sensational news here, made a really big deal. Remember the Maine, and really pushed public opinion toward war. Um, and the United States was really looking for a way to be a player on the world stage. And they looked out at the Spanish Empire, they looked around, Spanish Empire, Cuba's right there, and it was kind of like old and feeble. And it seemed a likely target. Also really importantly, if you look at a map, I think I've got one right here, um, all, all of these countries here Cuba, Haiti, Dominican Republic, um, all down here, uh, they're located in a place where if you had a navy and if you wanted to break through here to connect the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, and you thought you could, these areas out here in the Caribbean would make really great fueling stations. And so there was a really famous book that was written at this time called The Influence of Sea Power by Alfred Thayer Mann. And Teddy Roosevelt read it, and it was like, this is reality. We need a strong navy to be a strong empire. We need coaling stations. We need bases on all of these places. We need to control them. Um, I think I'm going to skip over this. The, the point about the Platt Amendment is you see that it goes from 1902 to 1934. It, it really did not allow the Cubans to govern themselves. The United States was really in charge. Things had to go through the United States because, of course, and I'm being sarcastic, sorry, they didn't know how to govern. And so we would have to be there governing for them. And we were there doing that until 1934. There was also an agreement that we would have the naval base in Guantanamo on Cuba beyond that point. Sugar had dominated the uh, economy of Cuba. And 
Um, many Americans were owned sugar plantations there, and they had a dictator, Batista, who was very friendly to American interests. The Cuban Revolution, uh, Fidel Castro, comes about in 1959, and communism was brought to Cuba. I think that's one of the reasons why uh, Cuban immigrants, m a lot of them coming to Florida, which makes sense geographically, right, were treated a little bit differently than the, we treat Mexican immigrants coming up um, across the Rio Grande, is that they were political, they were seeking political asylum from communism. We were in the middle of the Cold War, and this was um, an appealing uh, situation for, and, and they admired Cuban people for leaving communism and coming to this democracy. Um, this is our foreign policy. There were many political cartoons. I just put one in. Um, Teddy Roosevelt issues in 1904 something called the Corollary to the Monroe Doctrine, and basically what it is, is it's a justification for intervention. What it says is, we will go, the United States, we will be the policemen of the Western Hemisphere, and we will go anywhere in the Western Hemisphere where we determine that um, there is some kind of threat, whether it's the economy is faltering or political instability where Europe might want to try to come back and recolonize. And so uh, Teddy's often pictured as a policeman. Here he's got the barrel of the gun of the Monroe Doctrine um, on European monarch. And look at the poor person um, in Santo Domingo is like, oh my God, caught in the middle. I'm gonna talk now a little bit about Puerto Rico. So it was um, land of the Teano people when Columbus arrived, and he did arrive there in 1493 on a second voyage. Um, it was colonized by Spain for four centuries. I'm just going to say that again, four centuries. So um, when the United States went to liberate the Cuban people to give them freedom from the yoke of Spanish rule in 1898, um, the United States, as I said, didn't really give Cuba self-rule right away, um, but things are going to start in Puerto Rico. I've got sort of a timeline here. They became a territory of the United States. Um, by 1917, their self-rule was increasing. Um, they became citizens of the United States. They could vote for members of Congress, but they were disfran disenfranchised at the national level. They couldn't vote for president, still can't. Um, in 1946, uh, President Truman appointed, it, the Puerto Rican people didn't even vote for their own governor, who was the top person in the government. So the President of the United States would appoint someone. But President Truman appointed the first Puerto Rican governor. And then in 1948, the people of Puerto Rico were able to vote for their own governor for the very first time. I'm jumping forward a little bit to the 50s and 60s. Um, the story of Puerto, Puerto Rican migration to Connecticut really um, kicks off in a very big way with uh, the tobacco industry. So the shade growers actively recruited people from Puerto Rico. The economy in Puerto Rico was um, undergoing industrialization. It was called Operation Bootstrap. And the people that worked in, the, in agriculture, which had been primarily what was the, um, the economy was based on, were often left without work. So they were very happy to come to the United States. I don't know if you remember, when I moved to Simsbury 40 years ago, there were tobacco barns all down Firetown Road. There are only a few left. Um, there are tobacco barns, you can still see them very dilapidated over by um, the skating rink. And then out in Suffield, um, there are still tobacco uh, farms that are cultivated. But the um, inside of the barn is showing uh, here some tobacco. I'll just go through a couple pictures. Notice the age of some of the people over on the right-hand side of your screen who came to work. They built dorms for them. Here's looking inside of a, one of the massive barns um, at the tobacco that has been harvested and is drying. This is a picture of the side of a tobacco barn. The slats on the side of the tobacco barn would open out for airflow to help dry them because these were the outer leaves, uh, outer leaf for cigars, and they have to be perfect, right? Oh, you want to know something interesting? 
there were these little aphids that started eating at the tobacco leaves and there were no um, known predators. So we brought in, you know those little brown beetles that look like ladybugs in your house that you have to get a vacuum cleaner out and go around the window? Well, those beetles were brought in to control the aphids that were eating, um, making little holes in the tobacco leaves. Uh, in Hartford, there is um, there are many neighborhoods, and the, uh, the different neighborhoods each have their own flavor, and they also have very active um, community organizers in them. I'm going to focus a little bit on changes that have happened in Frog Hollow neighborhood in Hartford because it's really a very vibrant uh, community. Um, it has a lot of money was invested in it. Um, private money as well as city money. Trinity College, which is located very near to Frog Hollow, also infused a lot of uh, money into this. This is a the new, I don't remember when it was finished, 2012 maybe, a new revitalized um, branch of the Hartford Public Library right here in the middle. And it's got, it's unbelievable. It has 3,000 let me see how many square feet, 13,000 square feet, um, a separate children's room, a small cafe, and the second floor has a learning lab and a conference room, and you can rent out the space for conferences, performances, lectures, and other events. Um, the other uh, big happening that took time was um, Billings Forge. So there was a, uh, Melville Trust that in 2005 purchased um, a huge, Billings Forge was a property that had been shuttered in the, closed down, um, emptied in the mid 20th century. And then it had been a die cast and sewing machine parts uh, factory. And like Hartford was a booming industrial area. And when it, um, shifted from manufacturing to service in the country, and a lot of manufacturing went overseas, um, many of the buildings were left deserted. So what the foundation did, the trust did, is it not only bought Billings Forge building, but several other derelict buildings in the general area. Um, and the Billings Forge Community Works was founded in 2007 to drive community participation and empowerment. There's a really good restaurant there called Firefox. And um, if you haven't eaten there, you should. And one of the really cool things about it is that it demonstrates this participation and empowerment. I had a, um, a guided tour and you go in and people from the community, it's kind of like a hands-on business school or hands-on hotel school. And they're learning about the business of running the restaurant um, from soup to nuts. And it's um, a remarkable uh, project. They have community gardens. And if you know anything about cities, it's really, really hard to find um, fresh vegetables, right? So there are these community gardens and people who can come with their you know, whatever the new version of st food stamps are, they, and they're worth double. And they can buy vegetables there, um, and there's often uh, entertainment. And this is attached to, they use those vegetables for the kitchen for the Firefox restaurant. And here's was the opening of the um, cafe at that spot, and the very proud people. And this is another version, this is Broad Street, um, and this is the Firefox restaurant on the left. You really should go. It's really amazing. Um, Sarah Beth told me this thing closed. It's what? It closed? When did it close? Oh my God. Well, all right. So I, I have the wrong slide up, and then I don't know that Firefox closed. That's so sad. Well, nonetheless, nonetheless, it happened. And um, I, uh, wow, I didn't know that. I should have gone to eat there one more time. Um, one of the things that I wanted to sort of finish this out with is that, um, I don't know if you know who this is. This, do you know who this is, Rick? Roberto Clemente? Yes. Um, so one of the really cool things is when the Hartford Yard Goats 
um, launched their first season in their new um, stadium in Hartford. The first thing that they did, um, they inaugurated their new stadium in downtown Hartford, um, and that was in April of 2017, I think, um, was to retire iconic Puerto Rican ball player Roberta Clemente's number 21. Um, he played, I think, oh, I don't know, 18 seasons for the Pittsburgh Pirates. And you may not like baseball, but this was a really significant event. Um, he, by the way, sadly died in a plane. He was a remarkable human being. Um, and he died in a plane crash in 1972, taking, well, his celebrity status and taking um, uh, things to help Nicaraguans, Nicaraguan, well, because they had just had a really horrible earthquake. So he was a really good man. Um, and uh, the, one of the things that I think is that, you know, the fact that 29 is out there, it, it means something. Um, it sends a message. I think that Hartford is a proud Puerto Rican city um, and that it is at the center of a very proudly Puerto Rican state of Connecticut. Um, the formation of a Puerto Rican political structure in this city of Hartford and in Hartford city government has been studied around the country, studied as an example of how to win effective political power through concerted organizing. Um, I am going to leave you with words that Clemente said. So any time you have an opportunity to make a difference in this world and you don't, then you are wasting your time on earth. I might be a little strong wasting your time. Um, but this is a part of our Connecticut history um, and the Puerto Rican presence in our councils. Um, the pride parade uh, is, is a palpable thing and you should go into Hartford and experience that if you have not. Um, so I am going to turn this, remember please that I, I, in spite of the fact that immigrants pouring into this country are, there's always a backlash and people are going to blame them for all sorts of things. Disease. Um, they've been bl blamed, they were blamed in the past for tuberculosis, for polio, for uh, AIDS. Um, they're going to be blamed for these things. They're going to, people are going to believe they're bringing disease and crime, that they might murder people and rape people, um, that they're here just to hang out um, and get social services. It's just, it's, it's ludicrous, okay? So one of the things that it's important to do is to educate yourself on the historical, a historical awareness of immigration in this country. It will, I think, astound you it will certainly make you more appreciative of the diversity that Rick was talking about in the beginning. And I think in particular, um, Hispanic American history is so rich, involves so many different countries of origin, that it would be a really good place for you to start. <laughs> Here comes Lloyd. Thank you, Carol. And, um, Thank you, everyone. Um, you know, as Carol just um, spoke about um, the Hispanic American community, um, one of the thoughts that just popped into my head is the richness and diversity, the richness and beauty in diversity. And um, as we embrace that, it will just help us all to become better in all that we do. So I'm gonna pick up from here, and I want us to continue to speak about the, his, the, the impact, okay, um, we're going to take a look at, um, let me just go here, a number of different, the visualizing systemic racism, sorry. So I want to start that off by just going over a few definitions that we've heard and we've used and to just talk about what it really means when I'm using it. So we start off with prejudice. And it's an unfavorable opinion or feeling formed beforehand or without knowledge, thought, or reason. 
it's also any preconceived opinion or feeling either favorable or unfavorable. It's unreasonable feelings, opinions, or attitudes, especially as a, of a hostile nature regarding an ethnic, racial, social, or relig religious group. You see, it's important for us to remember that the struggles against prejudice is never ending and it often results in damage or injury. Prejudice operates to the benefit of those who are in control. So we use that word, so just wanted to, as I'm going to go through, we'll be using a number of different words, so when you hear it, to have a context within which we're using it. Implicit bias. So it is preference for or prejudice against someone or something. It generally runs contrary to our consciously stated beliefs about who we are and what we think. So implicit bias, it's a rapid and automatic association that we make between people and ideas and the attitudes and stereotypes that we hold about those people, ideas, or objects. So we all have prejudices and those implicit biases that are tied to it, we often do not realize that it's there because it's often rapid and automatic and we are not thinking about what it is we're doing, we're just doing it automatically. So when you hear the, when I use the word racism, I'm saying it's a conscious or unconscious belief in the superior, superiority of one race over and above another race or ethnicity. So this is manifested in a variety of dismissive, oppressive, and exploitative ways. It is the use of power to influence resources or communication which is employed to discriminate against marginalized, exploited, or subjugated people of another race, color, or ethnicity. So another term that we use is systemic racism. And um, the goal here tonight is to help us to visualize structural and systemic racism. So systemic racism is the presence of racism as defined above being injected into the society whether the systems are political, economic, educational, legal, medical, whether it's in housing or employment. Systemic racism, it is something that has become a part of the policies and procedures of how a particular entity operates. And what happens with systemic racism is you don't have to be someone who would be considered racist to be a part of and support it because it's, a, it's already in place and it's almost unnoticeable in the way it operates within our society. So so Structural racism are attitudes, behavior, policies, and structures that have been rooted throughout the fabric of American life and system even after the original laws that required them have been changed. Um, because these were originally based in laws or policies, these were the way things in society were operating. So there were laws that were passed. There were policies that were in place, and I'll talk about redlining shortly, um, but these are the systems that were in place, and even though laws were passed to change these things, they continued to exist in our society, or not everyone uh, participate in this or actively are involved in perpetuating this, but because of the way systems are set up, it continues. So when the laws were changed and bad laws were repealed, the system had already infiltrated the, in, had been infiltrated with the previous unjust laws. So these original unjust laws still express themselves in the structures of societies. And these have been evident in our educational, or political, or social, or educational, or legal, 
ju justice and in the employment systems of our society. Um, so redlining, what is redlining? So redlining is the discriminatory practice by banks and other financial institutions of denying or avoiding providing credit services to consumers because of the racial or ethnic demographics of the neighborhood in which the consumer lived. So this was a policy that started back in the 1930s. Redlining gets the name from residential security maps drawn by agents of the Home Owners Loan Association, HOLC, a government-sponsored corporation created as part of the New Deal under the leadership of President Franklin D. Roosevelt. On these maps, neighborhoods would be grouped into four color-coded categories, which with highly desirable neighborhoods shaded green and the less desirable neighborhoods shaded red. So there'd be a red circle surround or a red line, not a circle, a red line surrounding those neighborhoods. And these were neighborhoods that existed all over the country. They existed right here in our Hartford. Um, as you'll see in this map, in this map created in 1937 by the HOLC and available online, red neighborhoods were home to the city's black community and recent immigrants to the United States mainly Italian and Polish. Red, redlining controlled the racial segregation and, con and concentrations of urban poverty. Among many other problems, the legacy of redlining is visible in cities all across the United, United States to this day. And you know, when you think of redlining and how that is visible to this day, um, if you look into our cities, what you see is that there are pockets of significant poverty in our cities. Um, and for those of us who live out in the suburb, if you've never visited parts of our inner city, you would never know that this exists. Um, in your mind, it would be, we've made a lot of progress, and we have, because Someone like me can now live in the suburbs, but going back to this period up until I think it was 1970s or so when the law was changed, I was not able to, I would not be allowed to buy home in the suburbs. I would be restricted to one of these redlined neighborhoods. And what happens when a homeowner is restricted to this kind of neighborhood? What end up happening is your property value is, is depressed. So if you were to compare someone who purchased a home in one of these red line neighborhoods to someone who purchased a home in one of the suburban, the new suburban neighborhoods, you go back to the 1930s and look at the value of these properties, you will see that in the urban community, the increase in the value of those properties have been marginal. But when you look at the increase in value in many of these suburban neighborhoods, that the increase in that value has been significant. And why was that? It was part of the grading system that was used. So A was for the best neighborhood, B was still desirable, C was considered definitely declining, and D was considered a hazardous neighborhood. When you read that and when you think about that, a hazardous neighborhood, why would anyone want to live in a hazardous neighborhood? Why would the government and its agents and agency permit and, and, and restrict the ability of people to move out of those hazardous neighborhoods. Um, you know, the Homeowners Loan Corporation described 
a areas as hotspots where good mortgages, good mortgage lenders with available funds were willing to make their maximum loans. So the HOLC would allow people to get mortgages for up to 75 to 80% in of their appraised value in what was considered A areas. In B neighborhoods, it was considered still good, but not as, a, as hot as A areas. And these were neighborhoods where good mortgage lenders will, will have a tendency to hold commitments 10 to 15% under the limit. So around 65% of their appraised value is what they would lend to the, to the homeowners or the potential homeowners in this area. As we get to C neighborhoods, these were characterized by obsolescence and infiltration of lower grade populations. Good mortgage lenders were more conservative in third grade or C areas and they held commitments under the lending ratio, ratio for the A and B ratios. So they would be getting less than 65% of their appraised value. And think about it. If you're living in one of this, these neighborhoods, you have much more limited resources. So you're being, you have limited resources and yet you're being asked to come up with more money to pay for a home which will not appreciate that much in value. Before I even go to my next D neighborhood, um, D areas were characterized by detrimental influences in a pronounced, to a pronounced degree, un, under desirable population, which unfortunately meant, meant people of color or poor whites, or an infiltration of it. They, re they recommend lenders refuse to make loans in these areas or only on a conservative basis. So all of these had the impact of limiting opportunities for home ownership to black and minority communities, but it also allowed those who lived in the suburbs who had extra funds to go into those neighborhoods, buy property, and when they owned those, they did not take very good care of those properties. They would collect the rent and they would allow the property to diminish in value, which as I'll talk about later on, had a negative impact. It's like a domino effect because the value of the home is impacted. It also have other impacts on the community. So, here is a mapping of redlining in the New Deal in America. So this is an interactive map, map that was created through a co collaboration between four universities. There's a warning um, that is on these maps that said most maps include comments about each neighborhood from HOLC agents, many using language we would find offensive and racist today. So we're talking about structural racism. So how does structural racism work? So structural racism is a normalization and legitimization of an array of dynamics which are historical, cultural, institutional, and interpersonal that routinely advantages white while producing cumulative and chronic adverse outcomes for people of color. Um, so that's structural racism. Now there's another philosophy called colorblind ideology. And what this does, it says that only the absence of accounting for race. So if you refuse to account for race, that's what will bring racial e equality. So it requires the rejection of racial categorization and record keeping and make no distinction based on race. It relies on the idea that race no longer matters. 
And so what's important, though, is to remember that Martin Luther King's statement about the content of one's character and not the color of one's skin says nothing about being blind. Colorblind ideology assumes that society is fundamentally fair. And I'm not sure which of us today would agree that society is fundamentally fair. So what are examples? of structural racism in our society. I'm going to use two simple ones. And we've been through the pandemic recently. And when people got sick and went to the hospital, one of the things that they would use to check your, how well you're doing and the, the level of oxygen in your blood is a pulse oximeter. Unfortunately, this was highly, highly calibrated for white patients. So when black patients were tested with the pulse oximeter, it showed that they, it showed a higher level of oxygenation in their blood, even though it was not. And so what would happen is that many would be sent home. And when they were sent home, they would get worse and some even died. Another technology that is out there that has, um, unfortunately created some problem. And, you know, as I say, structural racism is not always intentional. It's just the way the system works because we don't always think about how is this going to impact everyone. So facial recognition, recognition software is a great innovation. But what it is, when it's tested, it's also primarily tested on the white population. So what this means is that it is on, it's inaccurate when it is used to identify people of color. And what has been the result of that? The result of that is that more often than not, people of color has ended up, who are innocent, have ended up being misidentified and arrested and jail for crimes that they did not commit. So that's, those are two examples, two minor examples of how structural racism work. So back to colorblind ideology. So it says that since most people believe in rac racial equality and since laws have been changed to outlaw discrimination, and since most people say I don't see color, it is assumed that I cannot be racist. And since no special benefits are accrued to me based on whiteness, what they say is racism is not causing these inequalities. So what is? With the philosophy of colorblind ideology, what remains for, these for the possible reason or differences is behavior. But, and you know, as we said here, because the laws have been changed, and I agree the laws have been changed, and, I'm th and th those, that's one of the progress that has been made, changed laws. But what has happened is, even though the law has been changed, it doesn't mean that everyone follow that, those laws. Our law today, and for decades and centuries, has prohibited murder, stealing, fraud, and many other acts. But that still does not stop people from committing these crimes. So it is progress that the laws have changed. But what is important to remember is that even though the laws have been changed, not everyone still abides by those laws. So we impute um, behavior to or cultural, imputed cultural limitation. Those are often used by proponents of colorblind racism to explain away that which is actually structural racism. A 2010 unemployment, the 2010 unemployment rates show that white America had an employment rate at 11%. During this time and at 11%, many white Americans were concerned that they would not be able to survive. What's interesting to keep in mind is that the unemployment rate, <coughs> excuse me, 
for African Americans has often been at 11 percent and is often tw twice the rate of the white population. Actually, in 2010, it was at 16 percent. So just one thing to mention here as we talk about colorblind ideology is most people have been raised to believe that colorblind ideology is a good thing. But I want you to think about what that really means. When we think about being colorblind, and I am personally colorblind, literally. I am red-green deficient. So what does that mean? Because it is a medical term. It is a, is a term that describes a specific condition. What that means is that because I am red-green deficient and I'm colorblind, there are things that I literally will not see. So there's a test that if you go to the optician, they'll test to see if you're colorblind and there are numbers or letters that's, that are included in this, on this sheet of paper or in this booklet. If you're colorblind, you will not see it. So when you say you believe in colorblind ideology, what you're actually saying to me is, you believe in not seeing me. Because, and I know that's not the intent, so the reason I'm sharing this is to, to help you to, let's not use that t terminology, because the meaning there implies you don't see someone. I, I want to be seen, we all want to be seen and valued for our uniqueness and who we are. So, under structural racism, it is believed that the jobless rate for people of color is a result of hiring discrimination, limited opportunities, and social networks that are limited. But under colorblind ideology, it is believed that the jobless rate is defined by individualization and it's blamed on the community's culture, behavior, and discipline. So, what are the excuses for structural, for structural racism? People justify it by saying that these are just structural anomalies. It's um, a one-off. You know, it's a, the, the criminal justice system works or generally works except when it does not. Or this is a procedural problem or this person had mental health issues and that's why the system failed in that area. We also say it's just one bad apple. Um, you know, whether it's a police or a teacher or someone doing something that's bad, it's this one bad, per, bad apple that nobody paid any attention to even after 10, 20, 30 incidents and there's no requirement for accountability from that person. Uh, she or he is so rogue that nobody noticed, and that is that one bad apple that for some strange reason doesn't seem to spoil the batch. So if it's one bad apple, it's been there and could committing these acts for over and over and over, how many other person have this bad apple spoiled? And then we have the demonization of the victim or the community referring to the victim as the son of an uneducated heroin addict, the child of a criminal, etc. This is demonization, marginalization, or reduction of the humanity of the victim or community. And this is in an effort to normalize the status quo and render structural racism foggy at best. So, when we think of structural racism, I want you to think of five key areas that are important and dynamic and consequential to structural racism. This is housing, education, mass media, wealth, jobs, and the criminal justice system. <clears throat> it's important to think of these things as the gears of a clock. Um, but interestingly, they can work independently but more often than not, they're working together. So 
like the gears of a, of a clock. So what we have happening is, as I mentioned redlining earlier, it was once used by banks. How does that impact the neighborhood? Well, I'm going to play you a video on redlining, but housing is the greatest transfer of wealth among families and between generations in the United States. So if because of redlining, the value of your property is not increased, and yet you're paying that mortgage for 10, 20, 30 years, and that after 30 years you've built up no value, you really have nothing to pass on to your descendants. So I'm going to show you a short video on how s structural racism in housing works. All across the neighborhood of Englewood, on the southwest side of Chicago, are big empty lots. It was a home here, a home there. The home on the other side was open, and it was two on this side. Asia Butler is a resident of Englewood and the executive director of RAGE, Resident Association of Greater Englewood. You're definitely in a place where redlining was very prevalent in Chicago. Um, the, what you're seeing is the result after about 40 or 50 years of what happens initially with redlining. Redlining was a policy that began in the 1930s in which the Homeowners Loan Corporation, a U.S. federal agency, gave neighborhoods ratings. It outlined areas predominantly in communities of color deemed hazardous. Redlining made it harder for residents to get loans for home ownership and in turn led to cycles of disinvestment. So it was, you know, this really, really effective <laughs> tool to create both segregation and inequity, right? So you're left with communities that are not allowed to be invested in by the people that live there or by others who might want to move into them. With no better financial options, the practice of contract sales followed. A type of loan that came with high interest rates, no equity gains until a loan is paid in full, and rules that allowed sellers to evict buyers for missed payments. A study by Duke University estimated black families in Chicago lost between three and four billion dollars in wealth in the 1950s and 60s because of contract sales. More recently, in the lead-up to the 2008 financial crisis, the same communities were targeted with predatory subprime loans. Redlining is no different from the knee on George Floyd neck. Um, the predatory lending is no different from that system. I mean, we don't call it redlining today because it was very explicit, but those things are still redlining folks from, from even trying to get home ownership or even trying to make a pathway to wealth. The impact of redlining on the Englewood neighborhood continues to this day. The community is scarred with a number of vacant lots and an overall lack of resources. And that, some argue, has led to the significantly lower life expectancy here when compared to white areas of Chicago. If we want to fix this, if we want to fix the inequity that flows from segregation, then we have to be equally intentional about it. It's not going to naturally work itself out. That raises the issue of reparations to black communities to redress the racial wealth gap. In the meantime, organizations like RAGE are doing what they can to reverse the cycle of disinvestment and build back community. Dan Williams, CGTN, Chicago. Okay. So that's... Um the impact of redlining on some communities that we have seen. And, um, you know, it's important to realize that it has multiple impact. When we look at education, education is supposed to be the great, great equalizer in our society, and public education is funded through property taxes. Property taxes is based on the value of your property. So because the homeowners living in these communities 
are unable to get loans to purchase and maintain a home or they're only provided with subprime loans, which puts them at risk of losing their home, the community will have low home ownership. Most of the homes will be owned by wealthy suburban, suburban investors who will not maintain the home, resulting in low property values and low taxes, tax revenue to support the school system. What this end up doing, it leads to lower graduation, graduation rates, which in part is due to the school to prison pipeline, which disproportionately impacts people of color. So, you know, it's interesting because it's important to have home ownership, but if we don't have home ownership or enough home ownership as we do in many of the urban areas, there's enough, is not enough resources, tax revenues to pay for those homes. And so what we end up doing <clears throat> is hurting those communities even more because the very basic thing that would help that community, which is education, is not available to the community. Um, this, this video highlights some challenges and what goes on with the school to prison pipeline. And I'll just get this going. And with zero tolerance policies, which mandated suspensions and expulsions for certain violations. They also cracked down on little things like talking back or uniform violations. The hope was that it would keep bigger problems from bubbling up. But as a result, out of school suspensions have doubled since the 1970s and they keep increasing even though juvenile crime rates have now been dropping for years. Around the same time, the number of police officers stationed full-time inside schools has increased by a third between 1997 and 2007. Ostensibly, they were there to prevent mass school shootings like the one at Columbine, but they end up being a way for schools to basically outsource discipline to the police. Schools with officers have five times as many arrests for disorderly conduct as schools without them. Sometimes the results are shocking. But the less visible effect is that schools are feeding the racial disparities in the criminal justice system. Consider the fact that schools are more likely to have an officer on their campus if the student population is more than 50% black. You might assume that that's because there's more crime at these schools, but although students at police schools are more likely to be arrested, they're not actually more likely to be charged in court for weapons, drugs, alcohol, or assault, at least according to one study. During the 2010-2011 school year, one in six public school students in the U.S. were black, but they accounted for one in three arrests at school. Same goes for other forms of school discipline. Black students are suspended or expelled three times more frequently than white students. It actually begins in preschool. 18% of preschoolers are black. But if all preschoolers suspended more than once, 48% are black. Studies show that differences in behavior can't fully account for these disparities. Black students and white students are sent to the principal's office at similar rates. But black students are more likely to end up with a serious punishment. One study found that white students are more likely to be suspended for provable offenses like smoking or vandalism. Black students are more likely to be suspended for subjective offenses like talking back or insubordination. Students who are suspended in school are more likely to later drop out or get arrested. So the federal government is asking schools to make suspension and expulsion the absolute last resort. In Oakland, California, public schools are trying something called restorative justice, where both parties in a conflict talk it out with a counselor instead of relying on punishment. The results are pretty encouraging. In the last 10 years, chronic absenteeism is down and graduation rates are up in the schools that have tried it. Other cities and districts are also trying new policies. They're hoping that if their students end up in the criminal justice system, at least it won't be because the schools push them there. not um, coming through. So um, again, my apologies for that. So 
those are two of the challenges that we um, that we face when we um, two of the issues we look at. So the next one is jobs. Um, black unemployment rate, as I said earlier, is always higher than white unemployment rate. Um, and you know whether it's college graduates, whether it's um, just someone on the street looking for a job, it, it's always the same. In 2019, the unemployment rate averaged 6.1% for blacks, 6.1% for American Indians and Alaska Natives, 5.3% for two or more races, for people of two or more races, 3.3% for whites, 3.2% for Native Hawaiians and other Pacific Islanders, and 2.7% for Asians. This chart shows unemployment rate by race, and this goes um, from, the from 1954 until, until 1971. And you can see there's always a significant disparity within the unemployment rate by race. And it is not a behavioral thing, because if it was just a behavioral thing, then it would never go below the normal, the average of 11%. And when it went down to 6.1%, it's because people, there were more opportunities available because there's a greater demand in the workforce, and so people were able to go and get jobs. Um, here's another slide which shows the racial gap in household income, which still persists to this day. So there's a number of challenges which people of color faces um, when you think about wealth and the racial wealth gap. Um, and this shows you, you know, what it is for blacks. Up until 2014, the average household income was 43,000. Um, for, for whites, it was 71,300. For Asians, 77,900. So there's a huge gap there. Um, and what's important for us to remember, another thing to remember is the media. The media has been at the heart of perpetu perpetuating racial disc discrimination against people of color. And this is by the images <clears throat> and the messages that they pass along. I want to share this video with you. And I want, it, hopefully this one will show. Um, but if it doesn't, I, I, you'll get the link. And I want you to watch this one. Because what, what this person was doing was basically rewriting some headlines. Why? To just show what happens when we change the narrative. What happens when we change the narrative? Um, The works. This isn't a grammar exercise. I'm really trying to see if I can disrupt subliminal messaging about who should be valued. I need a kind of one of the most respected institutions that kind of prides itself on getting this right to kind of say, actually, nope, you're not getting it right, right? The counter narrative series. The primary way you see it is in public, in the streets. We went to four locations between Bedside and Crown Heights area and hung them up. You can imagine who might be moving in at like the height of gentrification in many of these neighborhoods. And you're putting this print up of this like dead black kid. The title is Two Lives at the Crossroads. Equating these two lives as if they're neighbors. The Times layout to me perpetuated that. A subtlety there is that this is an equal, these people are on equal footing, they have equal responsibility in this 
event that took place, and I, that I, that's not true. I don't believe that. You have a cop and you have a kid, and there's a responsibility here, and it lies with one person more than the other. I know he was 18. I feel like if he wasn't black, we would be calling him a kid. But there's a lot of what, in journalism, is key information. He'd sometimes use drugs and he'd rapped, and I just don't think that that's necessary information. So I blacked it out. Like, oh, that's what you're doing here. That's what you're doing here, 18. You do drugs, and you drink, and you rap, and you curse. Because, like, really? Did you just write in here that you curse? But it just goes to show how important images are. It changed the way I viewed the text. Now you know he's a kid, right? <laughs> During the Olympics and the Ryan Lochte scandal, you have this headline about these swimmers, and then there's this big photo of Usain Bolt. And I remember just being like, what the hell? There's no way if the track team had done that, they wouldn't have been on the front page. People felt like I caught the times making a mistake and maybe willfully using the image of a black man under crime. I found a very good image of Ryan Lochte that was just him alone in the pool. I redacted most of the article, but I also inserted white Americans into the title to categorize it in a way that other races were categorized. I guess it's something restorative about it. The kind of restorative justice. You know, <laughs> online the hashtag was like white crime, white photo. <laughs> um, and that was really funny because people were like, yeah, that's actually a really good hashtag. When you were going with the fans, move back. Go, 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 go. I'd never, I'm 35, I've never seen a torch rally. Like this is some shit I feel like I would read about in a book. It was a riot by white nationalists, and I was like, they're gonna get it wrong. And they got it so wrong. It was a side piece. It had two columns out of the five on the front page that day. If you have a white torch rally, this is a major event, this isn't a sidebar item. For the most parts, I keep the layouts how they are. But the problem here was the layout, right? That's the journalistic hiccup here, is that this layout doesn't speak to the severity of these issues. What you give space to and what you allow people to see um, says a lot. The Tulsa hate crime is a really interesting one because I didn't really make an image swap. Vernon Majors is this white guy. He lives next to this Lebanese family and he had harassed them for years. And eventually, and unfortunately, he kills the son, Khalid Jabara. It runs with this wonky headline that says he's a Tulsa man and accused of harassing this Lebanese family charged with murder. Huh, that's interesting. The Lebanese family had been there for 30 something odd years, I say since 83. And this guy had been there like seven years. So I'm trying to figure out why he would get that title. If anybody was to get it, it's Jabara who should get that title. And I removed Lebanese. And I also inserted white American. I was really interested in the way the news can slightly other people. And I used to wear racism as well. Because he called the family dirty Arabs, but then it just says harassing. And I'm like, I don't understand why we can't just say racism. Like they just didn't want to use the word racism. The news cycle moves so quickly that we're all kind of skimming through things and we're just kind of accepting narratives. It's not always this bombastic and in your face. 
There are these subtle ways that racism works in the oldest of institutions. If it's not this egregious thing coming at you, I think it's so easy to ingest. You might not print Mexicans or rapists. What other ways do you contribute to the thinking about minorities? You have to be able to look in the mirror and go, we're failing in these ways. And if you don't see yourself as maybe just as much of a problem in some ways as Trump, then what work are you doing? What's important about counter narratives is that it's not meant to be like an indictment of news media. I could almost say that it's just as much as an indictment of the reader. Now, I don't know what impact that will have with the papers, but I definitely know people are saying to me, when I'm reading now, I'm saying to myself, why is this photo here? There's something about seeing a different image, about shifting the size of a photo. It gets at a feeling that people have, but they don't know how to explain it. Where I'm situated as a person in the margins, I think I can see where are there are gaps in ways that other people may not. I'm a black gay woman. That goes very much into kind of how I see the news, how I interpret what happens. What I believe might be an angle that's overlooked it doesn't necessarily mean I'm more right. It just means I have a different vantage point. But, um... You know, one of the things that I think is important, um, and I would ask um, that as we move forward, we think about these things. You know, those headlines that um, are part of this, they go back 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. And unfortunately, I see them today, even in our local papers, in the Wall Street Journal, the Hartford Current, all of these papers, I see those same things where there's this huge headline of some crime that is committed, the face of a person of color below that, and their picture has nothing to do with the crime. The same way when we saw the picture of Ryan Lochte and, uh, and about Amer an American swimmer stealing, the picture there was not reflective of what was going on. So what are our responsibility as Americans, as people who care? I would ask that we don't be color or race blind. Let's be color and race conscious. We've made progress in certain areas and certain people have opportunities that were not available 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 years ago, people of color. But there are still a lot of people whose lives are the same challenging, difficult situation that it was back then. So as we go through life, think about how many second chances you've been given. Do you want other people to get those second chances or do you give those second chances to anyone? Let's observe, reflect, and discuss what we've done, where we've made progress, and where we're going. Because yes, we've made some progress, but it's not for everyone. It's not available to everyone. As I said, you go into certain urban neighborhoods and it's no different than it was 100 years ago, 60 years ago. The, <clears throat> the other thing I would ask is, do not live in guilt, with anger, or in sadness. These are reasonable emotions to feel, but if we dwell there, there's nothing productive that will happen. So if we must feel them, let's feel those emotions and let's move on to more positive and meaningfully productive actions that will make a difference. So as we've made the present presentation today on, as I just did, visualizing 
structural and systemic racism, as we've done through the last, over this past four weeks to talk about what we've uh, experienced, it's not to let anyone feel guilty. Yes, we've made progress, but it's only in spots and it's not available to everyone. As a society, and, it's, and, and I say it's not available to everyone and it's not because everyone does not want it. It's because many people are not permitted those opportunities because of things that were done legally, structurally, and systemically in our society. So I want to thank you for joining us tonight. I appreciate your time, and I hope that as you go from here, you'll think about it and you'll continue to use this to make a difference in our world, in our country, in our community, and in your small circles. Because if we can make a difference in our small circle or impact those people, we can use it using concentric circles, we can go out and further out and further out to make a positive difference and to make the difference that we want to see in our world today. Thank you and have a good night.